code this on my computer and just uh just let everybody know uh, uh ray and i are coming a little early into it chris hasn't arrived yet and we're just having a great conversation so i'm, I'm just yeah. going to throw this in now and i can edit it later on and uh, so yeah, we were yeah. just talking about you know the rigidity of religions and how you know the 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 need for someone to explain the universe to you uh the people who you feel are wiser and and have spent a lot of time on it and in some yeah. cases i mean you go to the aztecs or you know i always think of it as a great triumph of civilization to have figured out solstice to have taken the time and done the calculations i think it's a triumph of man all the repeated times that we've managed to do this is like yeah, yeah that's yeah. the good stuff then come the middlemen you know and then come oh well it's a snake that's like uh, you know eating this and going there and you know doing all that kind yeah. of stuff <laughs> yeah well someone may have described it i'll have to be careful about that i some describe sometimes describe things it's like this and then uh if mine becomes religion they'll, they're gonna say he said that it's like a snake that it is a snake and stuff like that aren't they uh, it just it just um seems you know and it, here it is to this very day you know a uh, a, a belgian priest uh, says you know oh we have a big bang based if we interpret redshift in this fashion we'll end up yeah. with a big bang and his yeah. uh, his his catholic uh, uh church pals say yeah that's it because what are the first three because words the beginning the they the beginning yeah yeah <laughs> in the beginning you know you, you know yeah but they but they, but you know that they keep on publishing papers that say uh that talk about will it will it will it contract again and will it be a big bounce and whatever how many iterations of this has it done and so on yeah yeah, they I'm, want to end up with a cyclic universe. They can just skip over that. I'll give them a cyclic universe. But, uh, the way I see it is, I, I believe in observational evidence. You know, if, yes. if, if you know, for instance, they'll say, you know, we know that, you know, we know the temperature of the uh, of the corona is millions of degrees. We know that the yeah. uh, chromosphere is six thousand degrees. We know the photosphere is uh, five thousand degrees. Millions. We know the penumbra of a sunspot is four thousand degrees. We know that the umbra, the sunspot itself, is three thousand degrees, and that's as much as you know. And then what they do at the moment they can't see anymore. Suddenly there's a fifteen million degree core yeah. in the center of the sun you know yeah. because they're in love well, with having dropped an atomic bomb and they now they think they know a lot about to, how but what, how what about work. all the stuff above the surface of the sun that suddenly shoots up to millions of degrees again yeah um it's a, how does it I mean, a they've got no explanation good, for that whatsoever a perfectly good um uh law of, second law of thermodynamics going neatly all the way in one direction and then suddenly yeah. you know you end up and it's interesting ray you know if you were to comparatively drop the temperature of the photosphere to zero degrees celsius right and you were to drop mm -hmm. all the other temperatures accordingly well what you end up with is a, a ball where the center is 2500 degrees you know enough to melt steel uh then you have uh, the uh the ice ball of the photosphere and then outside that you've got the corona which is a temperature enough to parboil you or or, or vaporize yeah. you depending on what the what the uh, corona is doing at a given yeah. point in time and it's yeah, just I'm mention it's just absurd how yeah. you can just resign yourself to to uh you know some of the most soundest parts of of uh the thermodynamics the laws of thermodynamics yeah. and just throw them out the the, the window because yeah. you know You've got to make your thing work, you know. <laughs> yes. Now, before before uh, relativity, um, Eddington was doing calculations on the sun, and he said, if it's this hot on the surface, uh, and there's this much energy coming out, it's, he, the calculations backwards going down to the middle, how hot it'd have to be at each point to, to produce what was happening, what was seen, and he got to twenty million degrees. He wasn't far out. Wow, uh, that's not bad. And so he and he he, he said this can't be done by um, gravitational chemical means. If it was gravitationally worked out how, how old the sun would be, and, in, and they knew it was a lot older than that. So, so he knew there had to be some other form of energy before Einstein got to the other form of energy. And at that stage, he said, this is it. This explains it. <laughs> I've, I was always fascinated with your, you know, your uh, oscillation and cycles that you've been studying for so long. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I basically am a 
you know, acolyte in this. I just follow what yes. you, you basically, what you've been showing. And it's just been absolutely Thank fascinating. You. And one of the first Thank things you. I said to Ray when I first met you was, was, how come, you know, you've been studying the stock market and doing it. How come you're not a billionaire? And to which he said, well, I don't want to be a billionaire. Right. <laughs> uh, I've got enough. Well, I had enough. I, I think I've still got enough, but um I had some investments, and I don't try to do it myself anymore. I I, uh, I want to want to concentrate on research. Yeah, There's a little of bit of little bit of brain power I've got left, uh, oh. but I try to I try to get um, uh, other people to do that. But the thing is, um, I I had my funds and things that were returning eight to ten percent per annum, uh, and that was far more than I needed. But what they've done is over the last five years they've gone up at they went up for a while at you know eight to ten percent per annum, and then they've crashed it all. So it's back to where it was five years ago, or just a couple of percent below. Uh, so that's um, oh, to be fair, I did take some of the out and put it in the bank at three or four percent interest, and that's going up. So it's still getting some uh, to have enough to well, live on, you know. What I really admire about uh, about your work is that you've gone from the microcosm to the macrocosm uh, and all studied together. it all, which is really very impressive. Yeah, yeah. Most people, most people in the sciences, you know, uh, what's that famous yeah, saying? Yeah. Uh, an expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less. Well, you're exactly yeah, yeah. the opposite of, of that paradigm, and you've, you've basically a, studied the entire uh, spectrum of oscillations yeah. and cycles. You've got to be a Renaissance man if you want to understand it. Yeah. Um, what would you, if you had to pull it all together in, in uh, you know, a uh, paragraph, but we'll go into details, of course, if you would, what would you say you, as you lay down to die, you know, what you can yeah. say with satisfaction that you have achieved? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it is the understanding that everything is oscillations. Absolutely everything is oscillations in the fabric of the universe, which I like to call the ether, um, if it doesn't upset anyone. Um, it is the that. same thing as electromagnetic field, uh, but um, then that um, it, and that the current beliefs start from the smaller stuff and try to work upwards the properties of the universe. That's totally wrong. You have to start from the larger scale and work downwards because every wave that exists. Uh, so my axiom is the universe consists of a standing wave, um, which and we can put in brackets because of nonlinearities produces harmonics. And each of these does the same. They're also standing wave. Right. So that's the guts of it that, expl that explains everything. And when you start from the larger scale and work down, it does predict that there will be uh, structures at, at around about ratios of 10 to the 4.5. Um, and if you look at it, that goes from the Hubble scale to, to the spacing of galaxies, the spacing of stars, to the spacing of planets, to the spacing of moons. The next two steps, there's nothing obvious. They are about a mile and two inches, if we go in the old units, because they fit better. The next scale gives you the spacing of cells, the next one of atoms, and the next one of uh, nucleons. And the one after that presumably is quarks, or quarks, or whatever, however you pronounce it, I call it quarks. Yeah, I'll go with the quarks as well. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, okay. the, you you mentioned the. Oh, before uh, we go further, I just want to mention to our audience that uh, uh, Ray has borrowed a couch from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which may be there or may not be there. <laughs> Yeah, guys. Um, uh, uh, it's about the ether. You know the the uh, Michelson Morley experiment, and uh, you know yeah. what yeah. basically where it, it sort of turned everybody to thinking of space as being you know a, a complete vacuum, uh, and it's yeah. so so it really rather fascinates me that uh, you know we're. You know, Einstein, after having gone along with that, sort of had second second thoughts of it, maybe because of the data coming in. But you know, the what the other word for the ether is like the you know calling it uh, you know space fabric, and I think that's perfectly yeah. valid explanation yeah. of uh, of what what space is. It is a it is a, a very pliable, flexible fabric. But what fascinated me, and I'd be curious to know your thoughts on this, was that uh, you get to a certain point and it's very hard to stretch that fabric when you get down to 0 0.08 uh, degrees Kelvin, um, you know, minus yeah, 0. Yeah. <laughs> like it, it's, uh, it, it doesn't want to, it doesn't want to break. And, and which, which I just found rather oh, fascinating. But the, but the fabric isn't at that temperature. 
that, that temperature applies to the matter, which are just oscillations in the fabric. The fabric's temperature isn't changing when you do that. Um, the fabric tem temperature does probably change when you get in a black hole because the oscillations are so much uh, faster. So um, my, my way, I like to explain it as um, a, a, another word where um, people from different countries call it things. Uh, we get a bowl of what I call jelly, which Americans call jello, um, and you give it a wobble and it does, and you get all these nice little ripples running around all over the place. Um, and if you do it like this, you can get a particular sort of wobble, which does a nice yin, yin and yang thing, right? Um, and so maybe people will try and describe this somehow. And that, uh, then what happens is um, you've got to say, okay, we've got to scale this up to vastly bigger and we've got to scale the tension in that fabric up vastly uh, because we're going from jelly to steel to something else to the universe. It's such high tension because the sound waves of it are actually light. Um, and so the oscillations in it will move at the velocity of light. So <clears throat> in the universe, there's enough of it that that can take a while. And so when you, when you do it that way, uh, now why I looked at all these different scales is when I worked out the bigger scales, I was mostly doing bigger scales. I was interested in the cycle, so I had lots of scales to start with. But when you get to the scales, it's interesting because that's also a word in music. I've got some musicians behind me here, um, and that, that's it. But when you get to the larger scale, when you do the calculations, um, you get this thing about those different steps there. Uh, and when I realized that, I realized that atomic particles were just standing waves um, in the ether. So I, I put this conclusion um, on Newsnet groups as it was in those days. Um, I think that the, it was just about the time that um, World Wide Web was getting going, because that before that you had to go on the 1994, Usenet 1994, 1995. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was doing this stuff from, well, I was doing this stuff from before 1990, but a lot of stuff. Anyway, I did that uh, and I put it there and I, and I said, I've, I think this is what particles are. And I, I put standing waves that were doing, you know, near the center they would do, I can't do this from my hands, I used to be able to do this. This sort of thing, right? Um, so different concentric shells were going the opposite way as you went outwards. Uh, and I described all that. And um, and I got an email from a guy named Milo Wolf. And I highly recommend you to find one of his books. And he said to me, welcome to the club. And I said, what club? And he said, the club of people that understand that, that um, particles are just standing waves. Uh, in the, did he use, I think he used the word ether, in the ether. And um, I said, how many people are in the club? He said, two now. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Ray, what, what do you think of the, uh, in, in, in conjunction, you know, uh, as you're explaining, what do you think of the uh, slit experiment and, and how do you interpret it? Yeah, yeah, let's go back to that. Let's come back to that. But I'll just go a little bit more on this one yeah, because sure. if, within a year or two, there were 10 people in that club. Um, and then it turned out there had been two others earlier. Um, one of them is a Russian guy whose name is going to come to me. Anyway, you'll find him on my website. Uh, and the other one was a guy who did the maths that Einstein used in relativity. Now, what was his name? Um, oh, to... <laughs> I'm getting, yeah. I'm get... anyway, he, uh, as soon as Maxwell came out with his equations, he said, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. That explains it. He said, when there are standing wave solutions in this, and they will be atomic particles. No, he didn't have atoms yet. They'll be. He said all the matter will be made of these things, you know. So, um, um, but did you know what happened then? The silly bugger went and died, and no, <laughs> and the idea didn't catch on. And and um, so Milo Wolf found out about him saying this, and uh, that that's why they made the big mistake about the Meikles and Morley because they were assuming that, that all these light phenomena were a different thing from matter. Right, and right. Uh, when you understand they're the same thing, then you don't expect that result in Meikles and Morley because all the waves that are getting contracted one way, that all that matter is the same waves. Um, yeah. What's his name? One of the great guys at that stage, he, he cottoned onto that. Two of them did actually. Um, and they said that uh, what if matter is held together by the, um, the um, forces in the electron, and what if that, that electromagnetic and it does the same thing? So they were actually onto that. And those guys 
um, about five of the main ones in, in that, the, those discoveries never stopped believing in an ether. Einstein, Dirac, um, the other ones whose names don't come to me right now, um, all thought that. Now, what was your question again? Oh, that wasn't a question. It was just, I was just uh, wondering, it was the uh, split, uh, you know, the, oh, the uh, split. Yeah, the yeah. experiment. They, they tell you, they tell you, um, you don't get the interference uh, when you observe one of the particles going through the one of the slits. What they mean is, if you put a detector over the slit so it can't go through there, it doesn't go through there anymore. Isn't that so surprising? <laughs> uh, it's... Uh... It's interesting how the direction of theology in science has gone because of uh, seminal moments in uh, in uh, yeah. th in discovery yeah. and in the history and how it, how interpretations uh, have been made. You know, and I, I think to a large degree we find they in cosmology the as we have gone on in cosmology the the reality has been sort of left further and further behind when they talk about you know the dark matter which uh, to his credit um um uh, again the names as you get older are, yes, are, okay. are hard to do it gets worse um, as you get older <laughs> yeah um uh, but but basically uh, you know some people say well we don't know it's dark matter frankly it could be something that we just don't understand yet. and kudos to them because you know there's not enough cosmologists and physicists who are brave enough to say we don't know we think this yeah. but it's yeah. not the it's not facts but unfortunately yeah. you know the the journal uh, writers you know, who need a fast story, just sort of write it out as fact. And there you yeah, are, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, as Churchill said, history will be kind to me because I intend to write it. <laughs> <You know? Yes. laughs> and and um, then you end yeah. up going in this, in, in these sort of very sort of um, mind locked directions and very hard yeah. to get out of once you've, uh, once yes. you've created them. And I think that's one of the big problems of, of cosmology yes, cause... today. Only the people that are the, really the ones that are leading the way realize which things are well established and which ones are pop probables, possibles, maybes, and that sort of thing, which is what you were talking about there for those different things. And so they write, they carve it all into the stone and they shouldn't have. Some of it should have just been written on paper so you can screw it up later. Yeah. The, you know, the people who I look to at the moment are the ones who are doing the, the teams, the glass GLASS team that's looking into these behind me here, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, the, the yeah. deep field images and doing the work, doing the observational yeah. evidence, you know, that observation that's, is that's the key. powerful juju to me. And uh, is, those yeah, are my yeah. heroes, uh, the people who yeah, do well, that. I see people doing articles. Uh, one of the keys to things is scientists say, when they say scientists say, then it's going to be bullshit. But um, they, they do articles, uh, I lost the thread there, um, yeah, um, oh, yeah. Um, they, I see articles published where they say that they've shown that under this sort of circumstances, this sort of thing happens. And I thought I didn't know they'd done experiments on that. Turns out they haven't. They were simulating it on their computer. And um, yeah. But it doesn't say that, you know. It says that this sort of astronomical body does this when this under these conditions. And it's all just... Um, it's all just their imaginations. They don't, they don't know the difference between realities, theories, and simulations. Right. Sim simulations are, are very much garbage in or garbage out. Depends what you yeah. put into them. Like this article I was showing you that recently came out, sort of very pro Big Bangy article. Yeah. Basically, it's a guy who's done a new simulation uh, using the old Big Bang, uh, you know, that stars are smaller. I mean, galaxies are smaller and terribly brighter uh, you know and there's nothing like uh you know like uh, it, that you can see anywhere else in the universe it just seems like literally physically impossible but they work with that he doesn't go and try and say well let's do it with the with the uh assuming that distance makes things smaller Ooh, that's exciting yeah. who would have ever thought you could do that it's all basically based on the idea that cosmic redshift is an evolutionary measuring tool and now we know yeah. Yeah. because we've We've now seen the the dark ages which is really close to the big bang smack full yeah. of galaxies so we know that the 
you know, the that measuring stick of evolution is wrong. Therefore, the interpretation of redshift is wrong. Is wrong. And it's just yeah. so hard for you to you end up with endless articles still of them talking about yeah. young galaxies. They're not young, they're far away, no. you know. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the the um uh, my quite often I I work something out and I think that that could possibly be right. And then later on, I discover somebody else has had that idea before. Now, the first time this happened, I was pissed off because I wanted to be first. But now it means, ah, good. This is linking with some other knowledge, you know. Yeah, and one yeah. of those cases is that I worked out from the harmonics theory that because it's making smaller scales all the time, so we're in a part of the universe where, where we, we've made nucleons and it's now we're working on making quarks or quarks, as you'd like to call them. And, the, and those are not going to be um, fully formed yet, which is why they don't come loose. But energy is going into them. So uh, within, a, within a proton or a neutron, at a scale about 34,560 times smaller, roughly, is forming these other things, and energy is going to them. That means the standing wave of the particle, which is energy coming in, passing through the middle and coming out again, some of that energy is being absorbed into making these smaller particles at a smaller scale. So what that means is the energy coming out is slightly less than energy coming in. And uh, this is why gravity sucks. Because That's um, interesting. Yeah, I never thought if you put way. something in the way, the, if, if, there's, if my head is a yeah. um, proton or a neutron, and over, I'm trying to get the right direction, and over here, uh, over here is, an, is some other thing, um, the waves coming and hitting it from that side are from the thing which are weaker than the waves hitting it from that side. And that, and and that perfectly describes entropy. Uh, that's yeah, it very, describes that's the way gravity works. It does, yeah. yes. Yes, and this whole thing about entropy, yes, we come back to that. That's good. And the, um, so the, um, but when you do that, the mass of that thing must be rising. The mass of the proton and neutron must be rising over time. And so the, uh, um, the rate at which it rises when you do the calculation from gravity gives you the red shift. Except it's not a red shift, it's a blue shift. It's a blue shift with time, not a red shift with distance. The, the, the masses of all protons and neutrons are in the universe are rising with time um, in, in a uniform way because they're all got the same processes. Uh, not quite uniform. We'll come to some interesting bits on that. But but that that explains it links the red shift uh, with gravity, right? They're, the, they're functions of the same thing, and so um, over time that happens. Now uh, and so the constant is about one part in ten to the forty is the difference between the um, strength of gravity is ten to the forty smaller than the strong force, and the um, the amount of energy absorbed per oscillation of the proton neutron is about one part in 10 to the 40. Um, and the, the red shift is one part in 10 to the 40th per proton oscillation. And when you work it all out, you can get the Hubble constant. So, uh, so that, that fits it all together. Yeah, entropy, that's interesting because this whole process is one way. Um, stuff is being made at smaller and smaller scales all the time. Um, in our part of the universe, we're up to that part. I don't think it's the same everywhere. Um, I think when you get near black holes, they're ahead of us, right? So they've already made their quarks or quarks or whatever they're making, um, and they might even be working on the next thing. Uh, so the energies that you get, um, when you go from um, atoms interacting, you're talking uh, sort of about volts, right? When you go to uh, nuclei interacting, you're talking about millions of, you know, you're going up to a um, lot more. Um, when you talk when you talk about um, quarks interacting, you go up that much again. So so this is the um, scale of energies as you go down there. And when you go back the other way um, from atoms, when you can go to cells interacting, and you get to the really subtle energies associated with um, um, with life. Um, and so when they look for explaining life with the big energy, they're not going to find it. We're talking about tiny tiny fractions of a volt. Um, are, are necessary for those interactions of cells, so that they'll only see the next level. Yeah, so so yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, the um, 
What was the word you used? I'm sorry? Um, the, 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 the flow of heat. Oh, that oh the, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, uh, that you went, you're uh, talking about, that you know, this microcosm, you know, when uh, you talk to quant quantum uh, theorists, you know, when they get, when you get to the closest you can get to a vacuum, you end up with this uh, vacuum foam, which, which I find rather fascinating that, you know, that they're, yeah. you know, that as you approach this strange realm, that the thing behavior yeah. uh, that is, is like, a, so, I mean, I'm stretching it here and I, I'm, this is pure speculation. I mean, what, you know, be kind of curious if it turns out that as you push the vacuum closer, you actually end up with particles uh, coming out of it, um, subatomic particles, um, possibly even yeah. entire uh, huge uh, protons um, in the, the, if it was something like the like of the sun or, you know, some other high energy uh, source, but it, it may, you know, if you, it, it may give a, a sort of a balance. Another thing that I thought of it in terms of, as you were mentioning this, is that we can pretty much say now, and this is based on uh, the um, uh, the uh, Casimir effect, which you're, I'm sure yeah. you're familiar yeah, with the yeah. plates falling together, but, you know, because the wavelengths that are shorter can't fit in, or longer can't fit in there. So the plate closes. They've done that in the coldest, in the darkest, in the purest uh, of vacuums as they can manage. And that basically is work that's being created there. So what it made me wonder about is thinking back to Einstein pointing out that, that Mercury, you know, that the fact that it's not fitting the calculations. When you think yeah. about space as being everywhere under pressure, mm -hmm. Galileo's balls rolling down, you know, and supposedly rolling down at the same speed or the, the, uh, um, the astronauts on the moon dropping a feather and a hammer falling at the same speed. Yeah, that works fine for short distances. But if you extend that to say the guy with the ball and the hammer uh, to uh, say a, a, a hypothetical moon that's 50,000 miles away with no other disturbances, the ball is going to arrive first because of the interference of space. It's a very small yeah. amount, but well, it's well, remember, the ball is also, the ball is attracting the planet as well, more than what the feather is. Right. It's a tiny, right. tiny, tiny, tiny effect. Yeah, yeah. No, and um, so actually, it's, people it's can get small people. things like that that lead to great discoveries. Yeah, people have uh, got the result of the position of Mercury uh, um, ellipse um, with classical calculations. Um, and first of all, like people said, no, that doesn't work because of the speed of um, gravity, you know, which is a, taken to be the speed of light. And let's say it is. And they think that, um, that, that, uh, that that's the issue, but it's not. The speed of it, um, if you, people say, what happens if you put uh, a sprinkler putting water out on the back of a truck and you carry this truck along, um, where do the drops appear to come from? They appear, they think that the, the drops are come from the place where the truck was when the drop left to come towards you, but that's not the case because it's got the yeah. truck's velocity as well. And it yeah. appears to come from where the truck is now. And the only reason it doesn't do that is if the truck starts to turn a corner. It's acceleration is the only thing that changes where it appears to come from. That's and right. so when yeah. you do the calculation, it's only the acceleration that comes into it, not the velocity. Um, <clears throat> and on that basis, you can actually get the precession of um, Mercury from classical. And in fact, I'm going to go further and say you can get all of, uh, of physics with classical calculations when you don't get make, make mistakes like that. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. Um, uh, particles, um, <clears throat> I'm telling you that the, that the ether goes like this around the particle, right, as you go upwards. Now, a moment ago, you were talking about virtual particles and such like. Um, and um, have you ever seen them say that near an electron, it's like there's a, a virtual, a, a, some virtual um, positrons and then electrons and then positrons getting less as they go out, that there's like shells of that. Have you ever seen that description? Uh, I believe so, yes. Yeah, that's because when you've got the particle, you've got it going this way here, then the opposite way, then this way, then the opposite way. All the shells are going opposite, they keep reversing in a sine wave thing yeah. but uh, that that gives you the structure 
Of, and of and apparently, uh, it, it, according from from what I've seen and computer simulations, the uh, you know the uh, the foam almost works as a flow, like a unified flow. Uh, absolutely, where that's it's pretending that's exactly it's what I'm particle. describing. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm describing. Fa absolutely now, fascinating. Um, now, what know, happens? What, um, this this is real motion of the ether around that thing, right? The ether is doing this now. Um, if some light goes through that space, this is very, very small scale compared to light, but if light happens to go through part of that, it is getting, depending on where it is relative to a, uh, if, if there's a particle here, this is hard to do because I, I've got to look at my hands, not the screen. Uh, you've got this stuff doing this. If some light's heading this way, instead of traveling in a straight line, it's actually got to do this in the ether, right? If it's going past here, it's actually going faster, slower, faster, slower, because the motion of the ether is doing that. If you do these calculations, um, and uh, if we take something like the sun that's got this big mass, there's a coordination, all the protons and neutrons waves. When you get outwards outside the sun, the space is, the ether is doing this, right? Mm -hmm. If the sun's over there. So, uh, so now what happens? A wave that's heading towards the sun is wiggling up and down. A wave that's going across is going faster and slower, faster and slower. Uh -huh. When you do the calculations on that, um, in this direction, you get V here and C, the effect of C, and the, what you get on that side is the square root of C squared minus V squared, is the effective distance it travels, right? Uh, when you go this way, you get C plus V and C minus V, and when you average them out, you get um, one over, which without the square root, right? Um, you get the same result. Now, what does that mean? It means that, that it's not the space that's distorted, it's this effective speed of light is varied by those conditions. And when you do those calculations, you get exactly the relativity equations. Um, so, um, so the bending of light when it goes past the sun and all that are accounted for by these movements. It, it proves that this, stru this structure of the, uh, of the pa particle that Milo Wolf proved, he proved that for an electron, his equations were exactly correct. No one's actually worked out the exact equations for the proton and neutron yet, um, but um, it, it, because it's more complicated, right? Uh, you've got to have mo multiple ways. I'll tell you the electron pro structure. I'm going to use this as my electron. Uh, the ele here's, here's, a, here's a blob of the ether, right? What we're going to do to it, the ether's all uniform here, not, not doing anything strange. We rotate it through 180 degrees like that, and then we spin it. Now, what's going to happen? Your first thought is all of that space that's trying to follow, it's going to get all wrapped up in knots and it'll get, get ruptured or something. No, that's not what happens. Is when it's like, oops, I just pushed a button. Get rid of that. Uh, a mouse is a bad thing to use. It's got buttons on it. Um, so we've turned it upside down and we're going to rotate it. Now, this, I'm going to try and do this with my fingers. It's like that, right? The, the bit that's uh, there. Uh, so from the top, it's going out one way and from the bottom, it's going out the other way. Oh, As we rotate it, what happens? It goes around and it ends up up the, up the opposite way. So the thing, the, the line that came out of it goes over, under, over, under. It takes two rotations to get back to the original. And that's why the electron is called a spin half particle. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, Ray, just sli a slight uh, uh, segue of all your uh, oscillations and cycles that you have been seen throughout your life. What uh, yeah. what would you say were the the uh, the um, the ones or the one in using comparisons with the two that made you sit back in your chair and go, "Oh my God!" Yeah. Um... Uh, well, there was a funny one. Someone asked me a slightly different question, and I gave uh, I gave them an answer. Um, it was what it was sort of an aha. It was a funny aha moment. And uh, what happened was I was in the university library looking at um, um, astronomy cosmology books journals, uh, particularly looking for the 160 minute oscillation. And we should talk about that one because it's a very interesting one. Um, but then just on a whim, I put that book down where I was sitting, walked about three aisles over, walked down an, uh, an aisle and a half, and there were some books on ancient uh, astronomy from different places. And I, there was about 12 or more, a lot of volumes. I pulled one out, opened it at a random page, 
and it was on ancient Indian astronomy. And it said, and it was the calculations for the moon going around the earth. And it said, you first need to understand that the unit that they used was called a pada, and it was one ninth of a day. What's a ninth of a day? It's 160 minutes. <laughs> when I described this to my religious friend, he said to me, that's the finger of God pointing to you and saying, this is your life's work. Well, he was actually right. It was my life's work. <laughs> Now that's a, you know, I think those moments are the most precious and the ones that we strive for in that, you know, as, yeah, as we yeah, research yeah. Is, is when you look at something, you look at something else and you go, oh, wow. Oh, that, that yeah. is extraordinary. And I'm sure that it is that for you, you know, that, that is what, that's the addiction that, uh, yeah. that you know, has uh, sort of uh, held you in thrall throughout your, uh, your life. Yeah, yeah. And one of the, one of the things I do, uh, and astronomers get annoyed with me for this, I use light years instead of parsecs. Now, a parsec is a bloody stupid unit. It's yeah, based on yeah. the parallax Go. of the Earth's orbit. So it's a known multiple of the um, astronomical unit. Why don't they just use kilometers? We know what those things are very accurately. They could do it all in meters. Uh, anyway, yeah, you could, so you're the size of a honey jar, providing and, and it, use, it's uniform. <laughs> I use light years. I can claim that uh, Einstein effectively did this because he did all his distances and um, and things in, in uh, unitless things, you know, using speed of light and so on. But anyway, when you do this, you get some interesting things. For example, um, I knew that the um, that galaxy um, that um, geology some geologists there's a book called um mega cycles and these are the longest cycles i found reference to uh and it's um, done by geologists and it's it's um edited by george williams who's an australian geologist he has done some other interesting work which i'll refer to as well at some point and his and in that they came to a conclusion that there were cycles of about 600 million years 300 million years 150 million years, 74 million years, and 37 million years, quite clearly halving all the way. Uh, so if we double them up, we'd expect this to be a little less than 600, but they couldn't measure it that accurately, so I didn't claim that. Anyway, um, uh, I worked out that, um, hey, this is interesting, because I came across another one, which is the uh, 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 some Australian and um, American astronomers did this thing they called, uh, one went that way and one went that way, opposite ways that was, that was supposed to be. Um, they, and on a very thin line, they just went out as far as they could into these galaxies you've got there. Uh, and they measured the red shifts of them all and they put them on a graph. And when they did that, the graph went like this. So Extremely obviously- regular peaks, right? I, obviously you're familiar with the Milankovitch uh, cycle. Uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Which uh, is so very gonna, interesting, I think. Yeah, and, uh, but, but this one, these ones show uh, a very clear um, variation. Um, and um, at that stage, they didn't know what the um, Hubble constant was. They were arguing from 48 to 96, right? So, and some lot thought it might be, there were two, two groups that were getting these opposite values and then some of them said it might be 72 in the middle. Anyway, if you use um, 72 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec, which is a really stupid unit um, as well, um, because um, it says it's velocity and it's not velocity, it's a red shift. It should be given in Z units, what they actually measure, not what they interpret. But they do this all the time. Everything's always interpreted. So they can't break out of their belief system because every, all, all their measurements are done in things that assume their beliefs are correct. So, anyway, so if, you, if you had the choice, if you could, were ruler of the world, what would be, yeah. instead of the parasec, what would you use as the measurement? Um, well, uh, the, the, I'm going to tell you why light years are good, but we'll come. Yeah. We, we would we would probably use if we were if we use it we'd use meters, wouldn't we? Um, but anyway, but we needed we needed it this way because what happens is um, when you use the Hubble constant, you it come, turns out that these things are about 586 or 588 somewhere in that range um, uh, year years, light years apart, right? When I went to um, Russia in the mid nineties, I gave a talk on harmonic theory. Um, 
uh, th this was exciting because I was a keynote speaker at a conference um, celebrating 100 years from the birth of Chazewski. Now, Chazewski was the great um, cycles man of Russia, um, which wasn't always a good thing to be. Um, but anyway, uh, um, when, I, when I gave that, after, the, after my talk, Professor Afanasiev has written a book called Nanocycles Method when we translate it title into English, comes up and thrusts this book into my, he's a sturdy, stocky Russian and he shakes my hand like this and he passes, shoves his book at me and I grab it and I open it up and I see um, things and I understand, it's all in Russian, which I can't understand, but I can read the numbers. And there's a whole bunch of measurements of this one cycle and he gets 586,238,521 years Plus or minus a couple of hundred, so he's got he's got the cycles of five hundred eighty six million years, right? Uh, so I immediately know that fits in with all the geology ones of um, of Williams, um, and far more accurately. And I also know that that tells me combining the, the astronomical with that by realizing it's light years and years that they are talking about the same thing. One of them is the wavelength, and one is the oscillation period, right? Yeah, um, yeah. The ge geology is the oscillation. So when you do that and put them together, you can work out the Hubble constant very accurately. And at that stage, when I had William stuff, I got that it was about 72. When I had half an hour, I got 71.2. Um, the last time I looked at this was a little while ago. And by that stage, the 10 most accurate re measurements cited in um, uh, Wikipedia averaged to 71.2, though within 0.1. So um, that is the scale of the universe. We know it, it's known now through that method. Um, I've tried to tell a lot of astronomers this, none of them have taken any notice. Uh, and some of them, um, I, one guy was a physicist, I was talking to him about this stuff. Uh, the same thing happens when you do the, um, use light years again um, with the distances of the nearby stars. So distances of galaxies had been done and there were steps in them. Um, at smaller scales, this had been done in the solar system. People had realized the regularity of the planets, but it had never been done for the stars. So I got, I had um, Norton Star Atlas about a 1960 something edition, very out of date, but it had the distance to the nearest so many stars. And I put them all in in 3D, you know, with the coordinates and stuff, and I cal calculated out. And what I was looking for is are there um, regularities of structure in certain directions? Um, and when I did it, it gave me five directions in which there was regularity. Three of them were nearly at right angles to each other. And the other two, I think, would make us appear uh, uh, with one of the others of, of a similar nature, but weren't quite strong. So taking the three stronger ones, um, then what was this distance that they were regularly at? And it gave 4.43 light years. Now, when I did my original economic work, I got 4.45 years. And when I found Edward Dewey's work, he had 4.44 years. Um, so we have three things converging, two of them based on cycles and one of them based on distances. So that That's shows nice. that there's about a 4.44 year uh, light year wave that oscillates every 4.44 years um, and that the stars tend to be very close to the nodes of that wave, right? So that tells you something about how all this stuff forms. Now, is it perfectly regular? Uh, it, it appears to me not be. Um, now, for a start, it's slightly off being at right angles. And I thought, why is that? And then I realized if you've got a square, um, the waves that are running diagonally will be the square root of two times the side. Uh, and that's not good. Uh, but if you go a tiny bit one way, that diagonal will be near four over three, and that one will be near three over two. And they must as by one part in your, As you described in your video, that uh, we'll also, yes. of course, put in the uh, in the more links uh, on, on the bottom, that, which I found rather fascinating. Yeah. yeah, so that, and the difference between the two is one part in 288, which is also one of the very strong harmonics. So all of this shows that, um, that these things are linked up. And what's more so, so the um, astrologers are right that we're influenced by the stars. It's not really. We're interested by the waves that form the stars. We're not, interested, not so much influenced by the planets as the process that formed the planets. Um, you get the same stuff. Have, so, you, uh, have, you, have you spent time looking at uh, the uh, oscillations in the helioseismology? 
Oh you know, yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. The acoustic, uh, the acoustic vibrations. Yes, yeah, yeah. So they used to call them the five minute oscillations, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So I got, I got the values as they were. Quite it's, a lot of this is done quite a few years ago, uh, and they've got them more accurate now. But they were com he heaps accurate enough then. When I put those in, and I use a method that I, I call Kotov's method. Uh, Kotov's a Russian astronomer. And he did a lot of work on the 160 minute oscillation. Let's take a little detour there, but remind me to come back. Um, so uh, he noticed that the outer planets, um, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, we had Pluto was allowed to be a planet then, uh, they are at very near to 10, 20, 30, 40 astronomical units from the sun. And Jupiter is near to five, which is half that. Um, um, 10 astronomical units is um, uh, 80 light minutes, right? So uh, if we take a, uh, those planets at multiples of 80 minutes uh, or on the nodes of 160 minute wave with Jupiter on the 80 node of an 80. So those, uh, now these periods of 80 and 160 minutes turn up all over the place. Um, the 80 minute one, uh, you'll have heard of the sleep cycle. People say, call it 90 minutes. It actually averaged about 84. It's the 80 minute cycle. Um, so that is pulsing through everywhere all the time. Now, the inner planets, on the other hand, they lie on the nodes uh, of, of a six minute wave or three minutes. So um, Mercury, Venus, Earth uh, so roughly three, six, nine, twelve, but less so. The Earth's only at eight and Mars is a, a fairly, fairly bit off. The other planets fit more closely. But anyway, that, that, that wave structure is there. And um, when we look at these oscillations in the sun, they vary from about um, three to about um, 10 or 11 minutes. The peak is at just under six minutes, right? About 5.5 yeah. about or 5.7 minutes. Um, and so um, now when we start analyzing that for fractions and multiples, it turns out that um, there are certain multiples of these, um, which they all, that fits a lot of them. Um, so Kotov's method is you take all the values you've got and you take a test parameter and you very slowly vary it. And as you vary it, at each value, you divide it into or divide it by the values in, in your list, right? Um, now, you, and you're looking to see how close to integers it comes. You're looking for something that commutes with all of them. So when you, get, when you do it and you, you then take the decimal places of the thing, and is it above or below an integer by how much? And you call that, an, I'll call that an error or a difference. We add all those differences up. Um, and the smaller that value is, the better the test value fits um, to all of those things uh, or commutes with them. So when we do that, um, and, and uh, Kotov did this, for example, with binary stars. Um, he did it with um, asteroid rotations and all sorts of things. And he always found 160 minutes present. So it's quite clear that there is a 160 minute wave going through the solar system that um, that is responsible for its formations. The planets aren't in random places, you know, and I don't believe they're ever going to all fly off randomly into space. Yeah, you know, so, you know interesting, uh, interesting, useless bit of information uh, discovered in uh, in 2012, the uh, Hawaii Observation Solar Observ uh, Observatory discovered that the sun is perfectly round to within seven kilometers. Which you know, yeah, everybody yeah, thought yeah. before that there, that it should be oblate because it's spinning. Because it's rotation. Yeah, uh, but apparently yeah. It, that hasn't happened. Now here comes a mysterious. Hello, Chris. Question. Chris, it's good to see you. Welcome, welcome on board. We started early and we just started going at it. So uh, really good to see you. This is uh, for uh, our uh, audience. This is Chris Seely, who's uh, in many ways has a, has a lot of interest in in the things that uh, ray is interested in as well so um uh, you would you would have enjoyed the first uh, part of our conversation well yeah. welcome on board chris how are you doing i'm doing well how long have you been going here for an hour or more yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, the video. most of it's on video <laughs> yeah i'll catch up on the other video so nice to meet you <laughs> Carry so on. We, just, don't let, don't let me we were just Carry talking on. about this fellow Ko, Russian fellow Kotov, who worked out a method for finding out if you've got a list of values, do they commute with other values? And in particular, uh, he studied 160 minute oscillations and a lot of things. When I applied his method, uh, or when I looked at, I uh, didn't apply his method because the values aren't accurate enough. But um, uh, some time ago, I took all the black hole um, 
masses that they have for the black holes that have been discovered. And I took the list from Wikipedia and they, um, I, I looked at all those, I plotted them on a log scale and it was quite clear, but it's quite funny that there were bunches of them at certain places. The bunches of them um, corresponded um, when you converted them to um, uh, radius of the black hole to the um, distances of the uh, major planets from the sun and fractions. There were bunches at three minutes, six minutes, from memory, 20, 40, 80, 160 minutes. That, so all this stuff, so the same stuff. Now, uh, my qu the question that Stefan asked me, and I've done a big detour, and I'm coming back to you now, is had I looked at the, um, the, the, the uh, acoustic waves within the, the sun. sun. And uh, they used to be called the five minute oscillations. Um, yeah. They range from about three to 11 minutes. And the average is something like about 5.7 or 5.8 or something like that minutes. Now, when, when I look at those using um, Kotov's method and look for things, values that are near to multiples of as many of those as possible, it gives out a whole set of uh, values. Now I'm trying to remember them. One was 247 minutes, which is, um, uh, we had the 80 and 160, we've got 240 now. Multiple that, that detour, another detour before we carry on with that. Um, if you look at the um, period of rotation of the planets and also the period of a satellite that was put in orbit just above the surface, you find some interesting things. Um, the, um, the satellites that go just above the surface, for Venus and Earth, if I'm remembering correctly, is uh, both just over 80 minutes. Um, for Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune, I think, um, they are 160 minutes and so is the sun. So this 160 minutes, something that orbits the sun just above its surface will go around in 160 minutes. And for Saturn, it's 240 something minutes. So we're getting these values again. Uh, so um, then the rotation periods of the, the planets, they follow like, um, like we see in um, atomic structures, We've got um, rotations that we've got n, something or other over n squared. If we take um, the Earth and Mars, we rotate in both just in around 24 hours, which is 160 minutes times nine. If we take Saturn and Jupiter, they both rotate in um, four times 160 minutes. Um, now, some of the planets don't fit that. We've got Mercury and Venus and Pluto, who rotate in 6.4 days times n squared. So those were n squared, but four and nine, of course, but two and three times those. And we get the same thing with those ones. So the rotations and the um, masses and relative to radius and all of that of planets are not random. They're nothing like random. Uh, they're quantized. Yeah. yeah now, back to the other thing. So, oh, I was just going to say, Chris, we, we've gone from the microcosm to the macrocosm, but we're bouncing around. So, you know, just hang on to your yeah. coattails and... We're, uh, and uh, where does he want yeah, to end up? Where, where are we, we getting are. towards? Where's your... Where's Chris's interest? Oh, is that the interest, tiny so stuff, I, the big stuff, all the stuff? Uh, mine's, mine's interest is, is connecting the two together and trying to oh, use okay, yeah, all yeah. that. So, so yeah. basically, I'm, I'm on board with what you... I think I'm here. What I think I'm listening to you say is that... The, the, uh, if I understand it correctly, is you set the universal radius to a common radius, like a, you quantize it, you brought that in, right? And set the universal radius to Planck. But what was the setting for you? Yeah. Um, so I'll just finish off a little bit of that one related to your question. The values that all the other, all the values that came out, um, there's one value that's near a day. So it'll be 114, 40 minutes. But they were, you could arrange them in a table, uh, ratios two apart that way and three apart that way, and they all fit together. And that structure I've seen before uh, by Edward Dewey. Um, he, oh, he yeah, like a matrix. Yeah, okay, you like a matrix. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. he presented them. He, had, he started back one step. When I did the work before I knew about the Cycles Foundation, uh, I found four economic cycles. They, they, um, when I tried to determine their periods, I got about 4.45 years, 5.9 years, 7.15 years, and a little under nine years. But that one you couldn't get very accurately because the length of the data was not long enough. When I got to, and those all turned out to be 
35.6 divided by 4568. Uh, so 35.6 features and 4568 is a major chord in music, right? I've got some musicians behind me playing that. Yep. And the, the, so now, uh, when I get to discover Edward Dewey, he had a table. When I got to this, I got very excited. And he started from 35.5 years. And uh, he went down one way dividing by two and down one way dividing by three. So he got 17.75 years, 8.88 years, 4.44 years, very close to my 4.45. When he went the other way, he got 5.92, um, 1.97 or whatever it comes to. And that was very close to my 5.9 years. Um, when he went upwards, he doubled it. He got 35.5 years, very close to my 35.6. So quite clearly, he was discovering um, a similar sort of structure to what I was finding. He had a lot more data in his because they've been going a long time um, and they had thousands of time series, thousands of cycles. He called it hundreds of time series, but I'm pretty sure there was a thousand. And uh, um, thousands of cycles found to be collectively. So not all, he found there were a lot of common cycles. I can bring up some graphics of some of these if you want. Yeah, sure. Uh, Go right ahead. Uh, let me just locate them. Chris, have you I'm got some? Uh, I'm wondering if these, some of these cycles tie into a galactic electromagnetic wave cycle that's driving like the sun, and then as the sun charges and discharges the, the wave okay, function. Yeah, got the wrong one. Like the, um, the, the electromagnetic wave function is a ratio of sound. Okay. Chris, I know you've got some share screen stuff as well. Of, uh, I love your graphics that you've uh, you've done in in uh, you know that I've I've seen uh, with cycles and uh, oscillations. Mm -hmm. You managed to, to get that one up and running, Ray. Uh, I'm just searching for these things. Okay. Yeah, no. No worry. Yeah, okay. Let's... Here we go. Now we'll go to. Uh, the place where it says share screen. That one. Share. Now, okay, these yeah. ones. Oh, yeah, bugger, I made it. a mistake. Uh, it's, uh, um, I see it there. Is that showing you full screen or is that showing you? It's fine. I can see it pretty clearly. Yeah, it's full screen. But is it full screen or is it just showing a smaller window? Oh, it looks good. Uh, it's well, full screen here. Yeah. It's full screen. Good. Okay. Um, Wobbly Universe, that's what I used to, I used to write a blog called Wobbly Universe. When I write my book, it's going to be called Wobbly Universe. At one stage over that blog, uh, my blog was observed enough that when you looked up Wobbly Universe in Google, nine of the top 10 things were mine. <laughs> um, now, that was my economic cycle, some of my economic cycles. That's, that was my, my peaks that I found in the spectrum, which were four, five, six, eight. Um, and you can see a little hint at seven there and at nine and 10 as well. Um, oh, those arrows and that one. I'm going to turn, change. I'm just going to change this slightly. Let's go out of that. Um, I'm going to do it again, but with, um, with it really in full screen for me as well. Um, uh, Share screen. Okay, that's good. I'm just going to go through those to get back to where I was. Ah, I'm randomly opening things I didn't want to open. <laughs> the beauty of editing. Oh, okay. Ray. So those those arrows here are at exact ratios of four, five, six, eight, just to show that the peaks do very much coincide to those portions. Uh, and that's the major chord in music. After, after I did that, I actually did uh, got some wheat prices for a period of time. The, this was using annual data, so you can get only limited accuracy. I got weekly wheat prices because I thought you can make money with this. And uh, so I um, everyone thinks that, don't they? And that's how everyone starts in cycles. So then I did... Uh, uh, those wheat prices, and um, I got a lot of different cycles that had periods, various periods and weeks. And when I examined them closely, they were in fact, uh, most of the white notes over two octaves in the piano and two of the black notes, B flat and E flat, were also there as well. 
Um, and so um, it was clear it was music and, and having this four, five, six, eight was music here, it was quite clear it's all very musical. Uh, yeah, you know, this was my it occurs to, me, occurs to me, Ray, that the strength of oscillations like that are in their repetition, where the, where yes, the, really. the, 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 you know, one should never depend on them in there as their individuals. Uh, I mean, for instance, you know, uh, uh, Putin invading Russia and the, the corn, yes. uh, you know, the, uh, like uh, that sends everything haywire. There's no, you know, yeah. it's one of the chaotic moments, but then it settles back in, into, yes, into well, their cycle. Um, there was a, the Russian, I mentioned Chizevsky that I talked at his conference. Uh, he studied cycles and more. Now, cycles and more show cycles of 53 years, 142 years, 11 years, 22 years, and six years. Now, 11 and 22 years we know are um, related to the sun, right? And in fact, more will always happen when the sun spots at its maximum. Um, and if you like to look at since 1945, if you go to 1956, Russia invaded somewhere. Uh, I can't remember which one it was. One of those Eastern Europeans. 1968, they did another one. 1979, they had a go in Afghanistan. 1990, I think it was the Americans' turn to start invading places. 2001, it was America again. Uh, 2012, um, there was something. And 2021, uh, so quite close to um, the, this latest war, right? Uh, and they occur near the peaks of that cycle. Yeah. Now, this really is my model. throws a spanner in the works, doesn't it? Yeah. This was a thing that I, um, what it means is, um, uh, we'll get to Chazewski's quote. Chazewski's quote totally explains our position in the grand scheme of things. But this was my attempt to explain how the, uh, the moon and the planets affected the sun, affected the earth, affected the economy and all that. And, and, I, and I, because in harmonics theory, I had to produce harmonics of cycles. They had to be nonlinearity and produce multiple um, you know, cycles that were multiples of frequency, fractions of the period. And, and that was all thought I thought was important at one stage. Uh, subsequently, I realized that, that those things happened, but not because of that. They happened because of the whole structure of the waves in the universe. Uh, now, this, this bottom figure, bottom part, that's my funds, and that was um, Dewey's table, 17.75 years I mentioned to you. And you'll see he had 53.3 years, very close to Kondratius' war cycle. Um, he had 142 years was a war cycle, and um, the 11 and 22 don't show in here. Um, but these were the common cycles he found, and they fitted well. The 4.44 fitted my 4.5. 5.92 fitted that. Um, the 7.15 doesn't appear. The approximate nine would be 8.88, and my 35.6 was his 35.5. So Dewey was using different data from different countries in a different time period to me, and he got the same results. So these are, um, when we start to look at astronomical phenomena, I found these same periods kept turning up um, as interactive things. And so it is, in fact, um, a universal pattern of waves. Uh, that are happening there. Now, what was I trying to get to? There was something that I was heading towards. <laughs> oh, that's, well, that was one early attempt of mine to show uh, those are years at the, at the left of four and six uh, uh, months up to there. Um, and those are how many cases, how many times a cycle was found um, in different things. And you can see there's certain periods that are very common as Dewey listed. So four and eight months are very common. Um, two years is just under two years, 3.4 years is common, 4.4 um, years, 5.9 something years, um, nearly eight years, ne uh, around nine years, and so on, 11 years. And then out here is the 53 uh, or 54 year one. So these things keep turning up in lots and lots of things. There's one or two of them, like there's a 9.6 year one in there that didn't fit Dewey's table. Um, and so this is what I've done with Dewey's table is I've rotated at 45 degrees. I've got 17.79 years is my best estimate. Um, and, my, and then I've doubled it for that one and I've halved it to get those and then a third this way. So these have all got ratios of two horizontally and three vertically. Um, and most of these figures I've got up here are commonly observed cycles. Um, and now I've put a five ratio in there and we get another set above there of longer ones. Now notice that we get 11 and 22 years are in that set. Right? So I can't help thinking 
that Gruev must have noticed this because he had 2.22 and 1.11 years, and he must have known that that fitted the, the um, sunspot cycle. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he never mentions that. I think he didn't want to introduce more ratios. His ratios of two and three and the way he laid it out was exactly Pythagoras's lambda. But I don't see anywhere that he says that. Perhaps he wanted to let other people realize that for themselves. So these are commonly, these are, um, commonly reported cycles in many things or cycles in um, very important things, if there's not enough cases. Um, and these are ratios. The ratios I put there, um, they're all twos and threes within a block. And those are the ratios between the blocks, right? Now, and um, there's some smaller ones there. Then I, how do I move that thing to a different place? It's annoying, that thing. Can I throw it off the screen? I don't seem to be able to. OK, I'll just have to keep moving it around. Sorry. Um, there's a bar that starts off in the middle of the screen, and I can I, usually I can't move it, but today I can move it. And that's good. Um, yeah, we're not seeing that. We're, uh, we're not no. seeing that. That's not a problem for us. Yeah, it's a problem for me because it covers things up. Um, <laughs> the, um, there, there's a couple. Oh, of you can that move that bar, uh, it, Ray. If you you know what it says more on that bar, you can grab that yeah. bar, and moving it, move it around, so you can. And the more it doesn't say that it says. Record reactions to set, hide names, hide video, hide video panel. Is that what that is? No. Um, hide you're floating meeting about, control. You're talking about the bar Yay, at the bottom. I hide it. I, I thank it. you. You can hide it. Uh, All right. Okay. Oops. Okay. Now, um, Dewey mentions he, he, one of the most commonly reported cycles in America is 40.68 months. Now, there's a reason for this. Uh, it's in the stock market. Uh, and of course, that's why a lot of people get into cycles. Now, 40.68 um, uh, months is 3.39 years. So 3.389 years there uh, matches very, very closely to that cycle. And this happens when we divide one of these by seven, uh, specifically that one. Now, um, a bunch of other cycles were discovered by the guys that study the sun. There's one's called 155 day cycle. Um, um, that's um, 0.4237 years is 154.7 days. And there were other ones I discovered that were fractions and multiples of that and ratios of two and three. So a bunch of these cycles have been found in the sun. When we go down to 0.07 of a year, that is the rotation period of the sun. Um, and a number of these are found things. And that one there, um, is that stock market cycle. There's one other cycle that Dewey found that was commonly reported, but is not present in this table that I've assembled here. And it, he called it in a 9.6 year cycle. Now, I mentioned to you earlier about the ge long geological cycles, 586 million years and half and half and half and half. Um, there's also uh, one called um, mass extinctions. Um, and that, that's generally stated to be about 27 million years or a little under. Um, one guy told me from his analysis, it's 26.65 million years. So that agrees very well with that. Uh, these ones, 1.11 million and 2.22 million, um, they are, that 1.11 million occurs in the variations in the solar system. There, um, there's a big energy exchange between Jupiter and Neptune, I think it is. Uh, that happens that period. And uh, the, when they calculate the oscillations of the solar system over very long periods, they find several of these values. Um, at 1.11 so looks awful familiar. That, that reminds me of the, one of the constant numbers of the Bohr radius that I've seen pop it up in, in molecular equations. Yeah, now, um, like I'm wondering, do we do any of these numbers and ratios? Do they factor down or reduce down to any common constants? Well, these you know are of? periods of time. And um, what was his name? Um, there's, there was another American. The, the two most famous cycles researchers uh, historically were Edward Dewey in, in America and um, Alexander Chizewski in Russia. There's another one whose name was um, coming to me in a moment, um, uh, Raymond Wheeler, and he said to um, he said to, in one of his correspondences to Dewey, don't you notice the same numbers keep popping up again? And like you've got 1.11 there, we had 1.11 years in that table and 11.1 in on that one. We see lots of, th they do. We've got the 4.44 up there as well. Um, 
it's probably a coincidence. We can take what that factor is and we can find, yeah, it does come. Um, there's a factor of a thousand four and something, something comes to. So uh, right. that sort of stuff can happen. Do you have a formula yes. for, for spotting what might be coincidence and what is not coincidence? Oh, well, yeah, there are statistical tests for that, yes. Um, I, I'll, I'll call that, uh, I'm going to call that numerology. Now, I'm not saying all numerology is wrong, um, but I don't do numerology. <coughs> I was accused by one physicist of doing numerology when I told him about the 586 million year cycle and the 586 million light year cycle. He said, that's numerology. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. don't you know what numerology is? I said, actually, I did. I do, but do you know what physics is? And he said, yes. And I said, what's the formula that relates the wavelength and, and the period of a cycle? And he said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, what's, how does a wave move at speed of light and all this and oscillate? And eventually I got him to, to realize that, yes, a wave that has a 586 million light year length will oscillate in 586 million years. So he then agreed, that's not numerology. Um, well, I've got two quotes here, one from Dewey and one from Chizewski. Insofar as cycles are meaningful, all sciences have, that has been developed in the absence of cycle knowledge is inadequate and partial. It's a pretty strong statement. Thus, if cyclic forces are real, any theory of economics or sociology or history or medicine or climatology that ignores non-chance rhythms is manifestly incomplete as medicine was before the discovery of germs. I love this statement because germs was a big step in medicine and this is a big step in every subject. Um, and it is true that um, all of them remain inadequate and partial because none of them allow for these things that, that are clearly demonstrable in all of their different subjects. Fascinating. Yeah. And then this is Chizewski's one. Um, it, uh, initially, it looks more poetic than, um, than factual, but it's equally factual. Life is a phenomenon. Its production is due to the influence of the dynamics of the cosmos on a passive subject. It lives due to dynamics. Each oscillation of organic pulsation is coordinated with the cosmic heart in the grandiose whole of nebulas, stars, the sun, and the planets. Now, my favorite bits of this are um, the passive subject. We are life, we are the passive subject, right? We like to think we are controlling things and doing things. In actual fact, we're just doing the dance of all of those things coming from the cosmos. Now, the ancient Indians understood this, the Hindus and stuff, in ancient times, they understood that there was this dance of the whole cosmos um, and that it came down and affected uh, humans. So, so this is not new. Um, it's the same conclusion I've come to. And Dewey, I have to say, reluctantly came to that conclusion also. He didn't want to have his... Um, the cycles from beyond the earth, but when he started looking at them, they were the same cycles that happened on the earth, and he reluctantly came to that conclusion also. So those Chris, two statements uh, that they make are very important ones, I think, about the universe. Chris, uh, uh, you had something in our conversation about a week ago that you wanted to, to show Ray that you thought he, he would find uh, informative. Is that correct? Did I get that right? Yeah, I could just I could just send uh, is there a place to put a link in the picture in the side? That's my um, axiom for the harmonic theory. Oh, let me see. You pull that away. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Ray. Well, yeah, that right there, like the, the universe, the universe consists of a standing wave which develops harmonically. Like so, it's yeah. We, so I, I was I was uh, there, the standing wave, the the the, the universal. Um, thing has to be nonlinear. A nonlinear, any standing wave in a nonlinear system will develop harmonically related waves. Um, now, this is well known. You pluck a guitar, it makes all the harmonics. But yeah, what's nice. different here is in the universe, each of these does the same. In the guitar, the harmonics don't ha make harmonics of harmonics. In the universe, they do. Why is that? It's because it's three dimensional. In one dimension, you only get the harmonics. But in three dimensions, they become, because it, they, you get a, effectively a concentration of energy in three directions at once. Right. Um, that makes the new seed of a new wave um, and it continues the process. So, so that's the fundamental uh, axiom of the harmonic theory. Uh, we saw that one before. Um, those are some of Dewey's laws, which um, they'll be in your video. So you can look at those at their leisure. Um, they're, they're interesting. Uh, this is my calculation. First harmonic. 
the harmonic, let's call it the universal wave. Um, it loses energy to its harmonics. So I listed along the top uh, the, the, the frequencies. So one makes two, three, four, five, so on, all those. Two makes four, six, eight, 10, 12, et cetera. Three makes six, nine, 12, et cetera. Four makes, now before we do this, four got made in two waves. So I'm adding a total at the bottom as we go. Four is twice as strong. So when it makes the eighth wave, we put two in there and the 12th and 16th. Five is a prime, so it makes 10, 15. Six got made in three different waves as six is two times three and is three times two. So when we put that in, we put it three times each and so on we go. We total those all up at the bottom and we get this. Now, um, you can see that the 12th harmonic is, um, is a very strong one and so is the 24th. Um, in fact, when we do the number of ways they can be done, this is what we get. Um, and, and what we may notice here, first of all, is 36, no, sorry, 48. I'll go to the next one. Uh, I've, there's two effects going on here. One is the number of ways it can be produced. And the other one is the energy that goes to the higher the harmonics is less. So we've got to scale this combine those two effects to get this sort of thing to show the relative importance. And we can see that, the, that in this range, 48, 60, 72, 96, um, those are the ones that come out um, as being the strongest. Now, if we divide them by 12, we get four, five, six, eight. We have that little friend before. Um, if we'd like to um, look a little bit more detailed, we find we get the musical scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And we've also got mi flat and t flat there as well, which I mentioned turned up in the wheat prices. So that structure there exactly explained all the common cycles I was getting and in the wheat prices, particularly at the detail. And so we can see that the musical structure is showing up very strongly in here and in those things. I'm not the first person to notice that, that the musical scale showed up in the cycles. Uh, there, there's some other guy wrote a paper on that. And in fact, by his using um, Pythagoras's lambda, Dewey was effectively showing that, although he doesn't say it uh, directly. Now, we, that, I did that one by hand, but of course, uh, we can, when using computers, we can go to much higher numbers. So here's the first million. And what we see is, um, we can trace ones like two, four, eight, 16, 32, and it starts to drop away. And three, six, 12, 24 starts to come up. And uh, so, hang on, let's do the graph. Of, oh, I haven't got the graph of that there. Okay, forget that. Um, you find that these little peaks every so often of um, stronger harmonics. So this is, this is the, um, how strong the harmonic is for its size. Um, and we'll see this number here, three, four, five, six, so is an important one. Those two come out about equally strong, one, seven, two, eight, oh, but this is the one I've cho had chosen first. So I stuck with that one. Um, and um, we get these secondary peaks um, at 24, at 144, 288, at 2880, and so on, and they continue. Now, this is the calculations. I gradually did that calculation to higher and higher numbers. Um, and this shows out when I did it out to about 10 to the 50 something. Um, and you can see that there is this wave structure, sort of a wave in the top of it. Um, and you can also see that the further you go out, the more it becomes just a sea, a sea of uh, frequencies, um, you know, just a few stick out above that, above the top there. Uh, in the two bottom parts, I've only shown above 0.8. So there's a huge black area below that, just a, a wash with um, energy. So when they talk about energy, people talk about one upon F or one of such like energy, that sort of stuff is expected by the harmonic theory. That's interesting. Now I've taken the peaks of those waves there and I've gone along and I've put the, the very biggest harmonics, which I, I define the main line as those harmonics, which are the strongest ones that are linked by prime numbers. And when we do that, uh, we get this graph. Uh, and along the top, I put the, the, um, the ratios. And it goes 2, 2, 3, 2, 2, 3, 2, 5, 2, 3, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 7, 2, 5, et cetera. And after every ratio, you get a, a, a peak after every ratio, be, every ratio of 3, you get a small peak. After every ratio of 5, you get a bigger peak. And um, the other ones are a bit erratic. So, but what happens is when you get several come in, like 7, 11, there, you get a big ditch. And 13, 5 there, and so on. But I've, there's, you can see these peaks I've labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And um, those, uh, 
at um, ratios of around 10 to the power of 3.5. Okay. Um, I decided I put in, have I got the graph number of those? No, we'll come back to that. Uh, I put in, the, the, I showed you earlier a bunch of cycles up to 586 billion years. I took a whole lot of that stuff and I, um, and I put it in the computer and I took the structure that harmonics theory predicted and I compared them and I gradually changed. I said, let's assume that the um, fundamental cycle of the universe is 10 billion years, which is on the right hand side there. How good does that fit? The predictions of that fit with um, the observed cycles. Not that good. And as we go along, increasing that very gradually, we get all these little peaks. And every so often there's a bit of a peak that indicates maybe that would do it. But when we get out here, we get this series of huge peaks. And the 1.482 times 10 to 23 years is 10 to the 10th times as much as the age of the universe, according to the Big Bang people. And this says that's the fundamental cycle. So that when you use that period, um, it predicts the whole structure that's observed of common cycles. Uh, now, the reason there's ones at ratios uh, two above and below and three and four and things is that the pattern is very similar when you change that by that ratio, as we saw uh, in the thing, you get lots of ones at that ratio. So that's the period of the fundamental cycle of the universe. Um, to get that, I've used um, to, um, half an RC of 586.23852 uh, million year cycle, um, which when I calculate down from that, gives 11.8622 years as one common cycle. And that's exactly Jupiter's period around the sun. And Jupiter is the um, most massive planet. So it's logical that that it would be organized with an important cycle. Uh, and so those um, that fit to six decimal places on that, um, most of the other periods aren't known that accurately. So um, we'll, we can assume that the values that this comes out with are possibly more correct than the known values. Um, okay, go ahead. Yep. Uh, that's the, that's <coughs> the pattern of expected ratios of primes. This is the observed pattern that I had in the numbers that I uh, showed you before. Um, so I've put some of those there. Um, this is the com this is the, in the range of um, years, right? And the red triangles are um, Dewey's commonly reported cycles. Um, and I put a thing around in point eight six two two to show how that it comes out exactly. Uh, and that's why I use seventeen point seven nine years rather than Dewey's seventeen point seven five, and why I've got thirty five point five eight six rather than his thirty five point five on my thirty five point six. Now. Um, there's a couple of things interesting here. One is it does give the 3.389 year one nearly the, near the bottom right. Uh, the 40.68 month one is a strong one. Uh, now I haven't marked it, but that 3.395 is one of Dewey's common one, Dewey's common ones, and so are a number of these other ones. This 9.885. All these ones that are showing up high are actually common cycles. That 9.638 years. Um, I mentioned the it's a Canadian link cycle, 9.6 years. Uh, Dewey lists a bunch. He lists uh, about four or five that occur at 9.6 years, and um, four or five that he calls nine point he calls nine and two thirds years, which are 9.67. If we average those, we get very close to this figure, 9.638. So um, the fact that this predicts that value, even though we didn't feed it in, we could say it's fitting the others. It is. But that one yeah, wasn't I see, fitting. I, I see yeah. the seven, the seven, you know, the approximate seventy-two year cycle there is like the life, the average yeah. lifespan of a man, right? Yeah, that's right. So those ones are in the thing there, um, and uh, yeah, that's right. Is um, yeah, that reminds me of another thing that I did once. Uh, I've only ever found one person that mentioned anything like. To me, when I when we start from the Hubble scale and divide repeatedly by my three, four, five, six, zero number, uh, and the peaks don't occur at that exact interval, but uh, they it averages about that. Um, if we divide um, repeatedly by that, we get the typical distance of, between galaxies, the typical distance between stars, the typical distance between planets, the typical distance between moons. The next two, nothing obvious. The typical distance between cells, the typical distance between atoms, and the distances between protons and neutrons. And all of those come out. Now, 
that ratio there to me, when I look at all that stuff, it's totally obvious. And I can't work out why no one ever mentioned it before. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the only person I've ever found who mentioned um, a ratio like that is, uh, hang on, Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff, what was Gurdjieff's pupil's name? Oh, Gurdjieff. Yeah. That's with it. So just to Vince here or something. Yeah. Can't think of it. He mentions a ratio like that, and I think he comes to two eight eight zero zero, or or the values he gives indicate that um, he's doing he's doing something. He's not actually doing the universe, but he's showing something on that. He's the only person I've ever seen that's had a ratio like that, and no one ever picked it up from there. Um, uh, is, Ray, I think uh, yeah. Chris has some stuff. He, he just sent me a, a links to these. Would you uh, would you show these to uh, to Ray? Give Ray yeah. a little break for for a moment. And show yeah. you what, what you've so got there. Uh, I was just to say, just, just to say. Had, I just so mentioned those blue ones, which are the ones that the astronomers oh, okay. found in the thing. So it's that's working. Um, there is, I've got a CSV file on my website, which has got the factors of that, which harmonic it is. And if you put that figure in that I said is a long thing there and divide it by that, you can get all those periods out, right? So that's all available there. Um, and uh, do, I have, stuff there. do I have I your uh, you website? Do I have your website link, um, Ray? So Ray.terms.biz. Would you put that in the chat, the the link for me, when, or either that okay. or in the uh, in the uh, uh, Facebook uh, yeah. Messenger, either one. Okay, go I ahead. I wanted to show you this one, Stephen. That's the galaxies for mega walls in space. That's yeah. the one that corresponds to the five hundred eighty-six million year cycle. Um, Radio, there you go. Uh, uh, Chris. So by Chris. by mega wall by mega walls, Ray. I'm assuming like you're. You mean there's a like a, a boundary layer bubble way, way out that's kind of oscillating. That, that, that graph came from um, an Australian and uh, American study where they called it a pencil beam. They did one, the Americans did the northern and the Australians did the southern, and they just counted the galaxies at each redshift and produced that graph. Um, and so it shows quite clearly um, a very regular structure. That very regular structure, by the way, disproves the Big Bang on its own because if the Big Bang was true um, the, um, and there was a regular thing, as it expanded, it would become different, wouldn't it? I don't think it would stay the same. And yet that quite clearly is. And it corresponds, the 500, that corresponds, the distance between those with the correct Hubble constant uh, corresponds to the 586 million year cycle in geology. So that wave is going, we're getting those cycles are found in, in geology and they're found in space. And so the initial, the initial Big Bang oscillator, which would be the first, the first thump, right? That's still that wave is still going out to the edge and coming back to the center of every you, atom. So you, it's, it's you, like you a didn't constant. Listen to my fundamental cycle. The sun, fundamental cycle of the universe is ten million million times the age of the universe called the Big Bang. So there's no Big Bang. Right. Yeah. Fred Hoyle would be right. He, Fred Hoyle came to what he called creation events, which were. Uh, if you look at the rhythms that the harmonic series gives, it, you get, you do get that, but you get things like. Yeah, uh, uh, Ray, uh, uh, Chris is stuff. really good at graphics. Uh, he has. A, yeah. Would you show uh, uh, us what you uh, what you uh, sent me, uh, Chris, uh, on uh, share screen? I was going. I was just going to see if you could share it. Maybe in, um, let me see if I can share it. I'm just going to show this to. I got to catch up on everything. Grace, I feel he's got an entire lifetime of information there to go through. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Uh, if you watch the video back, you'll see the bit where I explain why it was my life's work. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree that the you know, like that's our thing too. Is I I don't think that the big bang, a big bang, the big bang theory is actually valid. So it's. Uh, right. Well, now we we you know, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, we know that's wrong. Uh, it's just taking them a little while. Yeah. Uh, it'll take about ten years to uh, to uh, steer the big, the cosmological boat in another it direction. Takes, it takes a, it takes a generation or two. Yeah, that's about that's right. That's right. 
I think of it more as the as the big fizzle, like there was a big fizzle, like condensation. It was, <laughs> it, it's you know yeah. it's obviously oscillating and vibrating. There is a wave function. Oh yeah, there, there is. Yeah, the, so the it's, guy, it's, early guys in um, in quantum mechanics realized that they weren't being able to convince the old guys. Um, and eventually, they had a meeting and they said, "There's only one way to do it. We teach the young, and we wait for the old ones to die off." And that's what they did. And that's what we have to do. So uh, it's all very well us old guys talking, but we need to get some young ones in it. I see. Ah, sure I'm interested in the geometry of the proton. I'm not sure what you can see there. So the, I just, I, I was a, I'm a co-author on this paper. I did the graphics for it. Yep. And uh, Jeff Yee is a mathematician and he's in the atomic physics. He's a computer programmer and computer scientist and Terrence Howard. So he's the actor, Terrence Howard, also, but he's also a geometer. He does geometry. He's really interested in uh, the flowers, see, like in sacred, ge sacred so geometry. You have comrades out there, Ray. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just kind of, if I can get to the end here, I'll just skip through to the end because that's what you want to see. Anyway. Uh, uh, Chris, have you ever come across Milo Wolf? Yeah, so this this work is based off some of the work of Marla Wolf and the the, yeah. Fernier, okay. the Fernier's wave functions and stuff. Um, so yep. and Jeff Jeff has actually written two or three books on quantum theory and particles. And he's so we actually we support the view of him that there is an ether or an ether, right? So yeah. So, so this is, is the way. Uh, is there uh, it, it, again, uh, if, Chris? If you will. Send me the links to this. I'll put them at the bottom of this video as well, so that Ray, in his own good time, uh, will be able to go back and look at what you're discussing here as well. Sure, absolutely. It's hard to absorb any of this stuff in a quick period, right? So I'll just get to the, the final conclusion of the paper here. Is, is essentially yeah. we set we set the universal radius of the atom to to be equal to the entire radius of the universe itself at Planck. So it's a scalar ratio. And when you when you do that, it sets the, the center function of the entire wave function to the universal the scale of the, the entire universe. Yeah. And essentially, um, gravity disappears and electromagnetism becomes a fundamental force. And, yeah. And uh, so then you end up getting out tetrahedral forms that are now self-organizing oscillators that create tetrahedron as the first fundamental principle. So the the, the shape of the proton becomes yeah. a tetrahedron, right? A tetrahedron surrounded by four bubbles. And the four bubbles are the electron cloud fields, right? So it's a, it's a yeah. So you uh, you would also like what's his name that made the um, geodesic domes. Uh, Oh, Bucky, like Fuller, yeah. Bucky Fuller, yeah, Bucky Fuller. Yeah, he was yeah. into this too, wasn't he? Yeah, so yeah. there's, there's. I'm into Bucky Fuller. I'm not sure my colleagues how, how big they are into Bucky Fuller, but I know that Terrence is into uh, uh, Victor Schauberger's work as well, right? So it's, it's all condensed matter imploding versus exploding. So it's all in, inflow and outflow, standing wave. It's just, it's just uh, yeah. waveform interference. So this is what we found. So I'll, I'll send this paper over to you because I think it supports. In one of your videos I was watching, where basically you said that the, you know, the universal radius is a common, that's the common yeah. radius, right? So this backs that up and shows that basically gravity is an illusion. It's a function of, of electromagnetism and that wave. So the, the two waves are like, um, you have an incoming wave, and so you get your longitudinal and transverse waves, but the, the, long, the uh, transverse waves will kind of keep electrons separated. But the longitudinal yeah. waves keep your protons connected, right? So it's like a, a two-way function there. Yeah. So they're they're in communication at all times, right? So it's, and so basically, the result of this this paper, I did the modeling in it. So then the for the graphics and so forth. So I'll send this over to you. And this paper and the paper here, I'll show you a video. Hopefully, this will be in theater mode. Oh, so you did some modeling. You did some. Simulations, would you call them, or what? Yeah, so these are particle fluid simulations that we've done that, yeah. that show how this, this functions. So this is, from the paper, this is your four your four electron spheres, and there's a proton center harmonic in the middle. So this yeah. is a single harmonic. And I'll let this run for a second here. Hopefully you can see it okay. Yeah. And then once you, so I, this is the general geometry, and then I'll hide the geometry here in the video and then let the particle simulator run. So this is simulated using 
um, fluid dynamics in blended systems. So it creates a three dimension. Yeah. It creates a three dimensional cymatic field of what the proton would look like as a, as a yeah. proton yeah. electron cloud. Yeah, I did a little bit of cymatic stuff once, which convinced me that um, charge is just the um, opposite phase. Um, yeah. And um, showed why particles like to be at multiples of a half wavelength apart. Mm -hmm. Isn't that isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Is that what? I find that I find that extremely fascinating. Like, you know, it's like yeah, the, yeah. They're, they're actually there's actually self aware if you think about it that way. Like every every atom is kind of conscious of every other atom as far as they can feel each yeah. other and they know their distance. They're talking all the time. It's like communication. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so this at, at the end, once the system settles, is this is when you get your points of resonance and then you create a tetrahedral yeah. form. So crystallization of the quantum part of it. Like this, so then you end up with a tetraquark essentially. So in that previous, oh, those little clouds there, what what is each of those little dots there representing? Probabilities or something or what? So you they're actually I mean? they're actually a three they're actually a solid particle in a three dimensional program, and they're yeah. the co the color is just showing their velocity. So so red would be at yeah. rest and blue is blue is, or red's fast and blue is at yeah. rest. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all velocity vectors in a fluid field. In a fluid yeah, uh, that's great. Well, I'd love to. I'd love to um, show you some of my stuff and see whether you can um, um, take it further. Because you, um, I've, I used to be a very good uh, programmer many years ago, many many years ago. I can't do that <laughs> stuff anymore. I can conceptualize it, but that's all. Yeah, I, th I thought you uh, and uh, Chris would get on uh, like a house on fire. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's kind of what I've been up to. So it's yeah, I saw your work and my my feelers and spidey senses are like, yeah, okay, this guy's on it. He knows what he's talking about. So let's let's yeah. talk to Ray. <laughs> yeah, no, I I am familiar with some of Dewey's work as well. Like, like I have read some of the writings and gone back and looked at what he did. It's amazing. Oh, okay, yeah, yep. Yeah. And especially since you know they, they were doing it all like man, like the pencil and paper, and like, oh man, <laughs> you know, it's amazing stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Chris is all over the, uh, you know, the cosmos as well, from the microcosm uh, to the yeah. macrocosm in, uh, in his scope of things that he's, uh, that he's interested in. And there's his website, of course, so you can, you know, well, yeah, definitely put that there. in, Chris. For, uh, you know, and, uh, so presently, what we did is we, we took that paper and we've now taken that, the, the geometry of the proton and applied it to drones. Um, the frame of the drone here recreates the moments of inertia within the proton electron cloud field itself. So then what happens is the result is this here you end up with the, uh, an emergent function of tangential flight. I'll show you this here. So we're for the slow computer, but So you see how these we yeah. built the the drone frames are the actual the interface <laughs> between your four spheres, right? And then wow. the inertia, and then so the the way the inertia when the props are spinning on that geometry. I'll try to pause it here so you can see it one minute when it comes up close. Yeah, I can see them. Yeah. Yeah. So they fly tangentially, so they fly exactly on a perfectly level plane and up and down, but they can also rotate around themselves and, and reference their own center of mass because it, each one is a gyroscope. Right? So here, here, here we're showing them spinning around their own center of mass. So, so by using the geometry of the fundamental physics of the proton and the magnetic moments of inertia within you know the standing wave, yeah, you get you get perfectly dead centered, like dead perfect flight. And then these can also because they're geometrically self-similar. Yeah, I think, that, I think I'll show it up here. Yeah, so they fly up here, uh, that's, and then that's great. and, the, and then they connect. They connect together to create a, a scalable craft. Oh. Right? <laughs> that's some precision flying there. 
Yeah, so it, you, they all connect together and then you could fly around as a single unit in three or four different, we don't know yeah. how many different. So have you made a big one that you can fly on yet? Uh, we're getting there. We're, we're starting to get there. I've we got seen some guys ones. that have done it. Yeah. Yeah, we got some smaller ones on the go there. I'll stop sharing them. Oh, that's yeah. excellent, uh, Chris. Uh, thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Chris. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so the, so basically the... The geometry that you were showing and some of the numbers that you're showing was actually, you know, it's, it's actually in there. It's been programmed in the geometry itself. Yeah. I'd like to show you uh, something that I only, I'll send you the link that I only found yesterday. Um, where is it? Uh, if I go to that, I'll find it because yeah, don't, I sent it. about to... the time, uh, Ray. You know, I just have to cut this out in the editing, so it's not a problem if it takes. You yeah. can take five minutes finding it; doesn't matter. Uh, I think I think Chris and I are quite patient enough for you uh, to to hunt it down. Okay, it's, is... it's so rare mm -hmm. that we can get people uh, like you know this together, and so uh, thank God there's there's the there's Zoom, so we can actually pull this off. Mm -hmm. I went to Russia and I put a link in the um, in the comments. I went to Russia in the 1990s. I'll tell you how it came about. There was a guy named Thomas Peterson in America, and he was arguing um, when he went to university or, or school or somewhere, they told him uh, there's no such thing as absolute voltage potential. There's only voltage differences. And he said, oh, this can't be right. There's got to be an actual value. And uh, he believed there was. And eventually made a device to, um, to, to measure what it was. And he discovered that the voltage on the surface of the Earth fluctuates by hundreds of thousands of volts. And he actually got some Russian people to make things for him because he found he'd get stuff made in Russia much cheaper than, um, than he could in America. So um, he was the one that put me on to some Russians. And he said, I think you'll find their work very interesting, and I think they'll find your work very interesting. And so I made a trip over there in the 90s, and, um, and, and we did find very interesting stuff. One of the things I got from them before I went was data on plutonium decay. They were measuring it uh, at different intervals. Uh, they were originally doing it once a minute, how many um, things went off. Um, and they recorded once a minute stuff for 18 years when I went there. Then they started doing it once a second, and then 60 times a second, and whatever. Um, the structure in this data. What they had found was that uh, they that they got when they plot took um, one hour of one minute values and made a histogram of the, what the results they got. They found that it went um, it tended to repeat after certain time intervals. Uh, it was more similar in adjacent ones, and after twenty four hours, it was more similar. And after a month, a, um, a um, uh, full moon month, it was similar, and after a year it was similar, and eventually they proved that the day, it was actually both sidereal and uh, solar days uh, were important, that it became similar. This, uh, I didn't know about this paper before, but this takes that further and shows that there are particular directions in space that have particular properties, and having your things floating in the air with those directions just reminded me of this. Um, mm -hmm. There's, if you go to the Cycles Research Institute um, um, uh, blog, you will find there's a couple of articles there mentioning Schnoll, which um, are, are very interesting stuff. The stuff they've done, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Like you, you say, you start talking about particular directions in space and so forth, and we can see how galaxies are aligned with long chains and threads. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the, the entire cosmic web, it, it reminds you very much of what the human mind or the brain must look like at the quantum scale. Like every neuron represents a galaxy, right? Yeah. The, the center point between two neurons where the fire is where a galaxy would exist, right? And then yeah. this is You're not just saying that because they're about 10 to the 11th of each and the next thing up, are you? <laughs> no, it just seems, I don't know, I don't know, it's just my instinct, yeah. it's, it's my instinct, right, when you look at the numbers yeah. and, and the way things repeat, yeah, I was, I was, hard, I, as you were showing some of the correlations there, I was, I was searching hard for, like, the Fibonacci sequence to see if that repeats itself anywhere in there, or the, the golden ratio, if it pops up, some of the numbers are obviously very close to the square root, it's square root of two there, you got, you know, the 2.82, right, P3, it's pretty close to that sort of thing, so. 
Yeah, yeah, I love the golden ratio and the Fibonacci series. Um, but um, what the golden ratio is, is it's actually the value which is least rational. Although you can approach it with the Fibonacci series ratios, um, for, it, for the size of the numbers you have to use, it's the hardest thing to approximate by a ratio. Um, all other, any other number you pick, any, any at all, rational or irrational, can be approximated by, um, uh, by uh, a ratio, much better than the golden proportion can. And um, people have said that the planets follow that, that distance, and I disagree, they don't. When you do a statistical test, they don't. But the, um, the outer planets, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, it's not a doubling, it's a one, two, three, four. Yep. And Jupiter is the half. If you look at that, it's very clear. It's musical, yeah. Yeah, the music, you, yeah. yeah. And sure, you can find one, two, three, five, eight in music and in the Fibonacci series, but after that, the Fibonacci series is nothing like musical. Right. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with you there. I think it's, and, and Terence and I have been talking about it a lot. It's, uh, it's too bad Terence was there. We'll try to get him on the call sometime. You know, I, it reminds me a little bit of what we're discussing going back in time to Johannes Kepler. Uh, you know, he, he made a lot of money uh, basing his, uh, his uh, uh, solar system on the perfect solids. And yeah, uh, he yeah. had the courage and the tenacity to realize when he when he realized that Mars didn't fit in, you know, he just scrapped it all and started yeah. from scratch. That is, yeah. that, to me, that's a freaking hero to do that. You've got to, you've be, got to, to be prepared that. to scrap things. Yeah. When I yeah. first did the harmonic theory, there were two ways to do the calculation, and one of them was easier, so I did that one. And two years later, I realized uh, it was the other one. <laughs> um, because uh, when you get the musical ratios, you get all these twos and threes. Under the first method, all the ratios of two were all the important cycles from the longest to the shortest. Now, I see lots of people do it using that, saying musical ratios, and we're doing repeated powers of two. And it'll work for a while um, because the power of twos are the most important ones. But um, as Dewey had, you had to have some powers of three and some other things in there. Uh, and when I went back and did it, it got a whole lot of stuff. And one of the things that tripped me up the most is one of these rotten coincidences that there was a 2,300 and a 4,600 year cycle. And if you went up from those ones of Dewey, you, you can hit those going up in powers of, of two. But when I got more accurate value for those and did a division, the difference, the ratio was 65.04. Uh, it wasn't 64. And then I realized, well, I could see there was a ratio of five to the other one. So there had to be a ratio of 13. Uh, and once I got that, I knew that, that the harmonic theory was the correct calculation. Um, where that I had then, uh, and so yeah, that's, so you got um, thir thirteen notes per thirteen divisions per twelve notes. No, the it's, no, the thirteen is an actual ratio of frequency. We don't okay. like that ratio at all. Okay. Um, it, it's too high up. It's in the thousands of years range. But you do get um, when you take. Um, I've tried to follow it all the way down from the largest um, to the smallest, and within each range, I can find lots of ratios. But between the groups, until you get down to the, um, at the order of a week, it all fits. Um, but the smaller ones, the next ones are 160 minutes and, and 80 minutes. But I can't get those to fit to there properly without having to use a very large prime that I don't think is part of it. Um, so there's a problem. But um, um, there, there may be reasons for it um, that we're moving around the sun and so on. And, and that, I don't know. It's funny, you know, when I was a younger man, I wondered if the uh, the tidal tension between the planets and the sun equaled the sun's uh, erg output. And I I didn't yeah. know, I'm terrible at math, so I had a friend help me. It took me about a year and a half to realize, nope, doesn't work. It's 164th of, of the sun's output. So the, <laughs> it was kind of like the starter engine to a car, but not the engine yeah. itself. So I had to dump that, yeah. but that, those were only. <laughs> the top, the, well, we, we, the we found, like, we the found that our like a lot of the research that we've been looking at shows that it's it's not an attraction function at all. But it's all repulsion and interference patterns. Like so, it's a wave function. Like I I, I envision seeing like the uh, 
the earth is actually repelling the moon. You have tides because it's the salt water that's driving the moon away rather than yeah. it, it's it's the electromagnetic function, it's repulsion, right? So because there's only tides in the oceans and not so much in fresh water, right? The continents aren't going up and down, you know, all the right. deep wells aren't aren't spewing the you know, aren't spewing water out every day right. of the deep well. Right? So it's Chris, can you see that first link I posted um, with the expand one in at the top? Because you weren't here at that time. Expand. So it's on I'll, I'll physics it. papers. Yeah. Um, have a look at this page. You talked about the moon receding. Um, have a look at this one about everything expanding. Because the Earth is expanding. Minutes yeah, I totally. Away. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, like that's part of my my work for you know, the last twenty years almost in the mining and minerals up in northern Alberta and the oil sands and, and, and uh, some, well, as a quality assurance officer on major projects for the mines. Do do either of you um, uh, studied anything about the Barry Center of uh, various interactions between yes. uh, planets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. No, there, sure. there are four theories of how the planets affect the sun, right? The first one was the tidal one. I worked that out for myself when I, in, um, when I was a teenager and I started getting a magazine called Sky and Telescope. Oh, and yeah. I started plotting the, the daily sunspot numbers and there was a four month cycle. Now, when you saw Dewey's thing, at four months and eight months were common cycles periods. Um, four months happens to be the period, or eight months is the synodic period of Jupiter and Venus, which are the two strongest tidal planets on the sun. Four months is the time when they make a straight line, either the same or opposite side, which is what's important in tides. So uh, I decided this is probably what it was. And if, if that was so, and they did hit a peak when they made a straight line, I started looking at other uh, combinations of planets. And sure enough, all those periods were there. And the peaks were when the uh, planets and the sun made a straight line. So that's the tidal theory. There's a guy, I've got a friend, Jean, something here. Okay. Um, he, he's done a lot of work on that on published all the stuff. And for example, he shows that the um, if you take all the um, past cycles of the sun and plot the period of them in a histogram, there's two peaks. Um, one at about 10.4 years and one at about 12 years. Now, if you take the Jupiter, Venus, Earth, good conjunctions, uh, and calculate those out. Um, Earth, they, there's a 1.6 year period that's, that's quite good, but it doesn't um, get the whole thing. Um, and that gets a little bit out, a little bit out until eventually it comes back again. It comes back again after about 11 years, but it actually comes back again after either 10.38 or 12.00 years. And that gives these two peaks. So, uh, so, that, so there's definitely a good explanation going on there for tidal things, but that's not the end of it. The guys that do the Barry Center show um, they work better on the longer periods of the sun. But um, in, my, in my belief, there's no actual mechanism. The Barry Center isn't a thing. And um, if you want to put, if you can, for example, consider put Alpha Centauri in the thing, the Barry Center for the solar system plus Alpha Centauri is two light years away or more, right? Oh, wow. So, oh, that's interesting. so, so it being outside the sun doesn't do a thing. Um, now, um, I did work out one other one. Um, I decided that uh, maybe um, one other thing I worked out was that, you know, Einstein and uh, that they did the eclipse thing where the, the light got bent by going past the sun during an eclipse. And Einstein's prediction was twice as much as Newton's. Um, so only 1.75 seconds of arc. And they did that. And it was that twice as much now. Um, I said, okay, that means that gravity is affecting photons in a different way to what it affects matter. Uh, and there's a guy, I've got a reference I can find if I have to, um, by a guy who, who talked about this and said, some people try to say it's a di distortion of space, it's not a real thing. Uh, he says it is a real thing, and he does the math very well for how to do this stuff. So anyway, I said, Rodeo, um, as far as I can tell, I defined a new variable which I called pull. It has the same units as acceleration, but you can't, you're not allowed to accelerate light. It's got to go the same velocity. You can accelerate it in the extent that it goes like that. It bends, that's an acceleration of the vector, but you can't accelerate it 
um, towards or away from something. So what I did with that is I took, um, I took it's the change in its momentum per unit mass. Uh, I think I've told you the right thing there, and that gives you the same units as um, acceleration. So uh, for example, light that's moving vertically in a gravity well, um, it gets red, red or blue shifted depending on what's going up or down. So you take that change um, and you, per unit mass, um, it's then it gets units of acceleration. Then uh, when it's going horizontally, it gets bent, but twice as much as what Newton said. So when you put those together, um, I assume that on average, um, if it's moving in random directions, on average, all, it's got two directions where it's doubled in one direction where it's the same. So you'll get five over three times the acceleration. I call it, I define it as pull. When you do that uh, and you start to consider what effect do the planets have on photons in the middle of the sun? Now, I rang the guy that, uh, there's a guy in New Zealand of in Christchurch, who's the guy that worked out the equations for a rotating black hole. So he's a very smart cookie. <clears throat> and I tried to explain this to him. And he says, it's totally negligible, it's totally negligible. I said, no, it's not, just hang on a second. I said, what's the formula? Um, for um, ex, um, distance traveled by something in terms of acceleration. And he said, it's half AT squared. I said, exactly. I said, how um, Jupiter is tilted, uh, the sun is tilted relative to the orbits of the planet. So, they, so the big planets spend years at a time above or below the plane of Jupiter's equator. And I said, all the motions in the plane of the solar system cancel out, but the ones in that direction don't. And, I, and he said, it's totally negligible, it's totally negligible. I said, how that bending of light going past the sun happens in a, in a couple of seconds. I said, um, what's the um, difference between, um, um, you know, order of 10 years in a couple of seconds, and it's half a t squared. Let's take t squared. It's bloody big, isn't it? He said, yeah. it's quite big, yeah. And I said, and the acceleration is extremely small, isn't it? Yeah, I said, why don't we try multiplying them together? And he wouldn't do it. He, he, he hung up on me. Anyway, when you do it, you discover that the photons in the middle of the sun, um, first of all, I was looking for something happening in the plane of the solar system. And I ignored the fact that the sun was tilted. And I got some answers. And that predicted a 5.5-year um, period in the sunspot cycle, not 11. So uh, I went back to it and I said, I realized that um, um, that I had to allow for this tilt and that all the other ones were cancelling out anyway. So I was looking for periods that related to the sun's rotation period. I was trying to find modulations there. Anyway, when I did it properly, um, it works out that the distance that will get moved, the center, the photons in the center of sun will try to move um, amounts of um, many kilometers, right? But only a portion of the mass in the center of the sun is photons. A lot of it is matter. Um, that proportion is very hard to find. If you look up how long does it take a photon to get from the center of the sun to the surface, you'll things, find things ranging from thousands of years to millions of years. So I just had to take a middle value and take a stab. And when you do that, it turns out that that's how many photons are in there, right? That the center of the sun is moving by kilometers. The temperature difference between the center of the sun and the surface is something like 14 um, a million K. So if you move a few kilometers, it works out you're going to affect the surface temperature by a few degrees K. Um, and because radiation is the fourth power of temperature, it has four times as big effect on the radiation output. Now, it's moving stuff out of one pole and in the other. So um, it's tending to balance out, but it's causing an asymmetry between the two hemispheres. Now, when you calculate all this, um, well, you don't get an 11-year period because the dominant one is Jupiter's period, 11.86 years. But Saturn and uh, Uranus and Neptune, it all come in, and you get a 9.93-year period of interaction of Saturn and Jupiter. Um, you also get a Jupiter, Saturn. Is it Uranus or Neptune? You get one of those, you get 11.07. Exactly the same average you get with Venus, Earth, Jupiter and the other one. So when you do that, you get these three peaks. There are three peaks in the spectrum of the sunspots. They are 
close to 10 years, close to 9.93, close to 11 years, 11.07, and close to 11.8 years of tuber period. And so when I did a calculation on that, I could get over a long period, I could get a correlation of 0.66 between that calculation and the actual sunspot oscillations. So that's, a, that's another method of doing it, right? Third method. That if, happens uh, to correlate uh, with the one that you mentioned. In um, a couple of months ago, uh, it, you know, I run this Tuesday Science Tech Nature thing, uh, and I pick articles that look interesting. And this this uh, this particular one piqued my curiosity, and it was because we you were just talking about this. Uh, I thought I'd show this one here. This is a uh, uh, sort of relates a little bit to what we were talking about. The planetary orbits may explain the mystery of the sun solar cycle. Have either of you uh, seen this uh, article? Uh, it, it appeared in various uh, magazines and oh, stuff. Venus Earth Jupiter, yeah, that's the one I was talking to you about. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's the same thing. I haven't seen that article, but my friend, um, um, where is he? He's got a French sounding name. Uh, I think he might be French. He, um, I've got references to him in some places. Um, he, he got that, him and I both got that. But the funny thing is, when I was a teenager and I first worked that out, I rode my bike into the city, which is about 10 kilometers away, and I went into the library, the main central library, and I looked to see if any books on astronomy had it mentioned it there, and only found one, and they said, oh, somebody in the 1800s suggested this as a possibility. We think it's just a coincidence, and it'll be disproved with time, and I said, ha-ha, you're wrong, it's not a coincidence, it's still being proved with time. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, why don't you show that wonderful image of the Barry Center uh, of the sun over a period of a thousand years? Yeah, I've seen that lots of times, looping around in and out of the sun. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that. That, is, seen that, that is strongly correlated with the one I just described to you, right? And the reason it's correlated yeah. is that those planets uh, have got approximately the same um, plane as each other. And the sun is tilted seven degrees to that. So when they form um, arrangements um, in those directions, it affects the sun. But when it's in the opposite directions at right angles, it doesn't. Um, and one guy that gave a talk about the 20, 60, and 180 year cycles and was talking about this Barry Center, I said to him, do you find that your thing works sometimes, not others, goes in and out of phase about every 1150 years? He says, I have seen something like that. And I said, that's why it's this, the one that I've described, not this. Coincidentally, they give a very similar result except for the inclination factor. So is this uh, something that uh, uh, Ray might have seen? Uh, or is this, uh, this is, is one of yours, Chris? Of it, yeah. yeah, this is one that I made based on Valentina Zarkova's work on the sun. And they showed in their work that there's a, uh, a cycloid cycle for the sun as it as it goes through the solar or through the galaxy as it goes travels through space, right? It's actually doing a cyclic a cycloid shape as it kind of spirals through. It goes to it tightens up. It's yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's breathing like this, right? Through a cycloid as it goes. Yeah. Through. So what I did is I plotted that. Oh, I mean, no. this isn't this, this is the space. space. In, cool. Yeah, and three D and a three D model. So I basically took it. And, and projected it forward, and yeah. you see when I zoom out, when I zoom out here, it, it creates sort of like a sulfa, you know, the sulfa sponge. <laughs> yeah. Right? If you took a, if you took a sulfa sponge and looked through it, that's what the the path of the sun over yeah. ten thousand. You're very years. good at this graphic stuff. I used to be able to do that fifty years ago, but um, yeah, yeah. Well, what I found uh, so fascinating was the the path of the sun on a magnetic on its mag electromagnetic path is actually programmed into the distribution that's a sunflower. of a sunflower. Yeah. That's it's amazing. programmed in, into the seeds of the sun, sunflower have, have actually programmed that jump tree. At least I'm, I'm hypothesizing that's what's Each happening. one of those seeds, it, if you rotate the Fibonacci proportion, 0.618 of a rotation, right? Mm -hmm. You put something, you go out a tiny bit and go 0.618, do the next one, and you keep doing that, that will produce the sunflower pattern. It also works for um, uh, the way pine needles grow, pine cones and pine needles on branches. And I've set this one for a number of people. You've got a branch. Um, you put a pine needle. You go point six one eight of a turn, and you do another one, and you keep doing that, just going up ever so slowly, and you get that pattern. When you look at it, it's got Fibonacci spirals. If you count the spirals one way, it might be five, and the other way might be eight. But when you mm -hmm. look at the tree when it's grown a bit, 
it becomes eight and 13. How does it do that without ever growing any more pine needles in between? <laughs> no idea. The answer is it doesn't. We do it. When it's bigger, our eyes connect a different way. We connect, instead of connecting that one that's got stretched now, we connect a different way. So those Fibonacci spirals are pure, they, they result from, um, from the golden ratio rotations. And that incidentally, if, you, if you're putting leaves on a, on a tree, a lot of trees do it this way, put one leaf, go 0.618, do the next one, next one, next one. If you do that, it always puts the next one in the biggest gap left. Or the biggest equal gap left. Oh yeah, it's just that it's following the that. sun's shining yeah, down, yeah. you get yeah. the maximum amount of sunlight captured. Yeah. And they haven't no, done it by a calculation of the square root of five uh, and all that stuff. They've done it just by gradually varying it until it's right. Yeah. And so you, so you end cases. up with you end up with an average because they're seeking the maximum amount of light, which is then the biggest, yeah, the, exactly. the biggest, the yeah. biggest void space is where you want to get the maximum amount of light, right? Yeah. yeah that's that's uh, that's beautiful work, Chris. Really, really, uh, really remarkable. Yeah, your, your, your graphics and that. I'd love to, to mention a couple of my outstanding things to you that I haven't managed to do and see if it interests you to do, do some uh, wonderful graphics of them. Well, maybe, maybe this is something we, uh, maybe we should do an episode two of, uh, of this because there's just so much. Go, uh, go, back, go back one step, please, to the, um, to the solar one coming out. Sure. Uh, the purpley, the one, the purple colored one. Okay, let me go back here. Uh, I turned it. Yeah, so at the end yeah, of the, the purple one there. Yeah. yeah. So that so that shows the solar wind right. coming out, right? Yeah. Um, now um, that um, so the sun's rotation is about twenty six days, but because we're moving around it we see it more as 28 days but um you're showing it with two things there which will give you a um a 13 day um but sometimes uh uh there's four um and sometimes there's eight and sometimes six yeah four is typical yeah. if you divide the 28 days by four you get seven days and that's where our week comes from it's nothing to do with the moon uh, the moon is 29.5 it's not 28 and people keep talking about it being from the moon. There is a cycle in the weather very close to seven days. And I've seen people complain, why do we get so many wet weekends in a row? And the answer is it's a seven day cycle. And uh, uh, so that one's, that one's quite interesting in, in, in its uh, associations. Yeah, yeah I, find, I, find it, I find that there's a three days, like I, I track the sun, but I, I'm at the point now where I basically predict my own local weather just by watching the sun cycle. I don't even listen to the news anymore. But it's, there's a three days output and then there's three days of, of absorption and then there's one day of hysteresis kind of thing. You end up with that sort of yeah. average, average six days of solar high and six days of solar low. And then all of a sudden there's, but it takes yeah. time for, it takes time for the earth to absorb those protons coming in and then create new creation sites. And then, and yeah. then it, it's, so there's hysteresis there, right? There's, yeah. there's a transformation time and hysteresis to convert that energy back into something else. Tom, right? so, Tom, Tom Peterson, who I mentioned, um, saying the absolute voltage is the earth, he found fluctuations of about those periods. He didn't look at the periods, but the graphs, you can see they had that uh, of the voltage of the earth fluctuating, you know, as you describe, it takes time to absorb those things. And yeah. the Russians have a lot of measurements of um, electrical phenomena and magnetic phenomena. And they find repeatedly three and a half days, seven days, 14 days, 28 days uh, in their stuff. I've got other things where I found um, 14, 28 days, 84 days, and some other longer ones related to that in those ratios as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we uh, have you created right here a, a uh, main feature film movie of uh, <laughs> of conversation and uh, uh yeah. i don't know if my poor editing system will be able to handle it so what mm -hmm. i want to do is uh, i i would like to uh, officially as far as the filming goes uh conclude this uh, in the next four minutes 
Uh, and we yeah. can just continue on talking. But I thank, frankly, I would love to capture more of this. So I'm wondering if if everybody would be in agreement to like uh, take a breather and uh, let us set another yes. another date for for more of more of this because it's oh, really yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a limit stuff. to how long you can record? Is there? Have you got some limit on what you can record? Uh, uh, so say that again, Ray. That what? Have you got a limited time that you can record for? Yeah, I mean, I've got, <laughs> I've probably got about two, uh, two hours and twenty minutes on this at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and, okay. Uh, yeah. So what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll I'll call it a a, a a conclusion. It's a pity that, that you have to do that, but what I would like to do is to I'll get in touch with both of you. And and set up for. Of course, you guys can just communicate uh, at another time. But I think, from a purely historical yeah. level, it would be really nice to capture it because you know yeah. when our hearts stop beating and uh, you know time moves on, it would be really nice to have this uh, yeah. this stuff uh, well, uh, as a hard copy of life. You know, um, so if this time of day, if this time of day of the week uh, suits you, we could do that on a weekly basis if you like. All right. You, would you, uh, Chris? Would you like to try again, uh, same time next week? Yeah, I could try. I mean, it might, maybe I'm not available every weekend, but I'll try to make a make a Saturday a, a regular habit for sure. Okay. Well, it seems to be the easiest thing to do. Uh, um, uh, Ray and I we co connected a little earlier than we should have. We just started nattering. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I wasn't sure if it was. Um... Uh, seven o'clock or eight o'clock. So I turned up at ten past seven just to check, and you were there already. Um, where's the snowflake coming from? Oh, I just I was just showing it in the background to give us something to look at while we're talking there. But it's yeah. some of my some of my graphics that I've done where I basically showed that the, the power laws yeah. are applicable to the snowflakes as they when, when I apply right. the harmonic theory around a circle. Yeah. Hold um, it and get, Hold it. And get this, the location. Let's do this next. Let's do this one next I, week. I get all the astrological it's a fascinating place to stop. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. We'll, so we'll stop here and hit it next week. Chris, uh, yeah. have your have your snowflake ready uh, yeah. next Saturday at uh, at the prescribed time. Uh, I'll uh, be on. Okay. For, for the, me, that's uh, one o'clock. I won't come in early next time. Say that we'll again. Right? Correct time. <laughs> we'll go at the correct time next time. I won't come in early. Right, eh? All right. Well, uh, thanks a lot, guys. I, I will uh, compile this. Uh, I'll put it online. I'll show it to both of you. If you give it a thumbs up, uh, then we'll publish it. Sound good? Yeah. Sounds good. Very good. All right. This is very good. Cool. I enjoyed nice this. Guys. Thanks a lot, you Thanks, too. Steve. Thanks a lot, Steve. Well done. Bye. Bye.